Next up is Joan Chow. Uh, Joan Chow is one of the first people to uh, dive into cultural neuroscience. Um, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology in the Interdepartmental Neuroscience Program at Northwestern University. She received her BS uh, honors from Stanford in 2000 and her PhD from Harvard in 2006. And her research centers on investigating how cultural factors influence the basic psychological and neural processes underlying social and emotion processing. Uh, with an emphasis on integrating psychology and neuroscience, research with public policy and with population health issues. Please help join me in welcoming Joan to the podium. So it's my honor to be here at this CARE conference, and I'm uh, delighted to speak to you today, especially in the morning, to discuss the integration of compassion and empathy, and particularly from a cultural neuroscience perspective. I think we can all relate to these kinds of somewhat distressing images that we see, particularly around the world, when people are encountering different types of uh, natural disasters. So anywhere in any type of geographic range, we could see essentially people suffering um, due to no fault of their own. Um, and, you know, this has been a psychological process that we've understood for many years, particularly within both Western and Eastern science. And I think that um, some of our most eminent Eastern and Western scholars really uh, conceptualize the idea that um, humans have this amazing ability not only to recognize, but also to respond to the suffering of others. And, um, you know, I think that definitionally is a really nice way to start with kind of understanding or parsing the human experience of understanding and recognizing suffering and then responding to that suffering. So compassion essentially being a feeling that arises when you're witnessing another suffering that motivates a subsequent desire to help. And then secondly, um, empathy, the responses that are more other-focused than self-focused and that the feelings of sympathy or compassion or tenderness and the like essentially guide us towards ways of helping one another. Now these are all conscious understandings of the, the human and non-human ways of understanding that empathy and action uh, coupling. So um, I want to describe, uh, from a cultural neuroscience perspective, essentially how we can understand what it feels like to really have compassion or empathy, and then also how to respond in ways that are uh, truly pro-social. And <clears throat> I'd like to uh, introduce you to this framework that was developed in 2007 um, by Nyla Numbadi and myself, looking at uh, how we can integrate cultural and biological sciences, essentially integrating cultural psychology, social cognitive affective neuroscience, and neurogenetics, and really integrate cultural and biological processes across multiple timescales, so situation, development, and evolution. Now these dynamic cultural biological interactions have been um, of great interest to developmental and evolutionary uh, psychologists and, uh, and scientists for many years, so I, I'd point you also to uh, the amazing theoretical work of Xu Chen Li and Paul Bates and uh, Max Planck, who have essentially uh, also um, really argued for the importance of integrating cultural and biological processes. I'd also like to introduce you to an, uh, a model that was de uh, developed by uh, Kate Blazinski and Mary Helena Lamordio Yang and myself. And essentially, what this is is a model of human behavior that really integrates um, both ecological pressures, culture, and genetic processes as a way of understanding and predicting how the human, the mind, and brain work, and then ultimately behavior. So, if the behavior we're really interested in is prosociality, how is it that we can really understand prosociality as a function of multiple variables? So, um, in particular, when we're applying cultural psychology to understanding um, how the mind and brain work, we've, you know, there are multiple different sets of variables, essentially psychological variables and also um, neural variables. And what I'll introduce to you today also is empirical evidence that shows that essentially that there is this... Um, uh, mapping of psychological processes and biological processes, but we do not yet know really precisely how it relates to prosociality, true prosociality, true helping behavior. And um, essentially, uh, I will highlight to you, uh, in particular, uh, a subset of neural regions that seem to be very reliably activated whenever people really are witnessing aspects of compassion, empathy, sympathy, and concerns for others. So in initial empirical evidence, um, one of the very earliest investigations that uh, Tetsuya Daku Norihiro Sadato at the National Institute of Physiological Sciences and myself, uh, uh, as well as Melanie Ambadi, Alyssa Amanoff, uh, Moshe Bart, and Massachusetts General Hospital, what we essentially uh, investigated was how culture influences neural processes underlying emotion recognition. So uh, emotional expression is essentially, at least argued from Darwin all the way to uh, Ekman and, um, and Matsumoto, is certainly something we can consider as an innate ability. In, in fact, blind and deaf children, despite the uh, absence of sensory input, can smile, laugh, and cry. 
Now, at the same time, we also have this amazing perceptual evidence that we can actually recognize these distinct emotions from facial expressions. These are quite uh, extreme facial expressions, but even within microexpressions, so like this very exciting work by um, Ken Powler's group showing that even very subliminal or unconscious presentations of microexpressions can essentially modulate neural processes. Now, there's also been um, just this uh, whirlwind of really amazing cultural science evidence showing that culture influences emotion, both anthropological and also um, from cultural uh, psychology. So, um, <clears throat> Embody and colleagues, uh, Hilary Elfin, El um, Elfenbein, have essentially shown that um, there's this in group advantage. So, essentially, um, even in behavioral evidence, people's uh, the ethnicity or their cultural heritage can essentially prime them, even nationality can prime them to even recognize the emotions of. of of group members uh, better compared to um, to others. Uh, essentially, there's also display rules. So David Matsumoto's uh, group work showing that essentially um, there's um, you know display rules that emphasize when it's appropriate or inappropriate to express emotions. Um, emotional sensitivity, so how it is that we have the uh, capacity to really recognize the feelings of others. And then ideal affect, so this amazing uh, novel work by Jeannie Tsai and uh, Brian Knudsen and colleagues showing that essentially that, you know, it's not only how we emote or how we uh, recognize, but it's even the ideals, the, the conceptualization of what we think is an ideal affective state. And so culture can essentially really influence affect in multiple ways. Okay, so... Um, now, in this particular evidence, what we found was essentially that people um, tend to recognize fear expressions better when expressed by members of their own culture. People can infer nationality uh, better from emotions expressed from neutral expressions. And even in group, these in-group biases might even be uh, akin to perceptual systems, so uh, similar to uh, language and face recognition uh, tendencies or proclivities. So even sheep can recognize uh, sheep of their own kind. Um, now, at the same time, while cultural science is having this sort of revolution, um, within neuroimaging, we've, it's been predominantly a Western science. I think the idea, the weird problem introduced by Heinrich Norenzian and um, Hein and colleagues, you know, suggesting that within the brain sciences, it's been predominantly mostly a Western. Um, and, uh, you know, in this initial uh, empirical work, you can see that, you know, with the, uh, the really the 1993 to 2003, tremendous growth in neuroimaging, but predominantly uh, within Western populations, and that's certainly appropriate given the um, uh, infrastructures within Western countries. Um, now, some of the amazing findings from these initial investigations show that within these limbic region, within these limbic systems, such as the amygdala, there's, the, there is this mapping of, of certain specific neural processes, uh, neural uh, regions to specific psychological processes. So that the amygdala is essentially orienting people towards um, specific affective cues and resolving ambiguity. Now, um, in some of our initial cross-cultural imaging work, we essentially showed that um, when you're com looking at com Caucasian Americans with a ja native Japanese, and they're perceiving different types of facial expressions as well as neutral expressions, and they're just, this is simply a really overt task. So it's just, you know, does this person seem angry, fearful, happy, or neutral? Um, even within specific regions, as uh, the bilateral left and right amygdala, you can see that there's this increased neural response um, towards uh, own, uh, own culture fear faces compared to other culture fear faces. Um, this effect appears more pronounced within the right amygdala compared to the left amygdala. And it's certainly possible that the cultural specificity that we observe within behavior is, may reflect, in fact, neural tuning of amygdala response. From a neuroscience perspective, this is exciting for us because it suggests that you know not only is culture influencing emotion at a behavioral level, but also on a biological level. And essentially also it suggests the amygdala may be part of a neural network that facilitates this group selection, the, uh, David Sloan Wilson's idea of group selection, um, in empathy and altruistic behavior. Okay, so <clears throat> amygdala seems to show this cultural influence, and um, we don't show that it's related specifically to prosociality, but as compassion researchers and compassion experts, I think we can all understand that the ability to even to de detect that it, there's some kind of suffering or there's some kind of distress in the, in the environment is a cue that we should respond, and that our brains are biologically responding to that kind of external environment or external cue. Um, now, I'd like to introduce you to the work of Vani Mather and Tokiko Harada. These are um, amazing scientists and uh, that are now uh, research professors at um, Nagoya University, and Vani is um, starting at John Hopkins University with Claudia Campbell. Now, we started to investigate now this, uh, this additional link of how culture can not only influence affective processes, but also empathic processes. Um, <clears throat> 
So, you know, we understand that there's essentially multiple routes to empathy. Um, there's this affective route, this affective sharing, empathic resonance. We really feel vicariously the experiences. At the same time, there's also this more cognitive process um, of a perspective taking or that, you know, we essentially um, can in understand via a, a more, uh, a less aroused but more um, cognitively appraised type of um, experience. So. Essentially here we can see that um, you know, we wanted to look at how African Americans and Caucasian Americans, when they're viewing the distress of others in natural disaster kind of environment uh, or scenes, you know, how does the mind and the brain really appreciate or understand um, the suffering of others? And these, these stimuli were taken at the time um, by CNN from the, uh, when Hurricane Katrina um, had sort of ravaged New Orleans. And, you know, there was this idea that, okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of distress out there. We see people in rafts, you know, um, let's respond to that region. And, but, you know, there was also a, a question within American uh, society about, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to really fulfill um, the goal of showing compassion, and that is to help them relieve distress. And uh, what we found essentially was that African Americans and Caucasian Americans, these are, all Afri these are all undergraduates, essentially show this increased neural response within ACC and also bilateral insula. This is correlated also with behavior. So they actually report that they feel at the empathy for these people, irrespective of any type of group membership. Um, <clears throat> but then we also see something that's really exciting because it very much resonates with social psychological theory of in-group processes, simply that um, within, um, within the medial prefrontal cortex, there's this increased response within African Americans towards African Americans. Um, it's not really a, a derogation, but it's more an uplifting. It's the idea that they really feel this in-group love or they feel this kind of um, prosociality or identification with um, other group members. And you can see here essentially that this, this effect of showing this increased um, in-group love towards group members is correlated within regions associated with medial prefrontal cortex or the idea of um, more cognitive empathy as opposed to more affective empathy. Okay, so essentially we were able to show that there's this neural dissociation with affective and cognitive processes. <clears throat> affective being more within the bilateral insula and ACC and then cognitive empathy that's more within this kind of uh, MPFC uh, perspective taking region. Now, um, we also were able to relate it to actual cultural values. So there's a large literature showing that ethnic identification, the ability to really recognize or um, identify with a specific ethnic group, um, predicts um, empathic neural responses. And within these cortical midline structures that you saw uh, presented by uh, uh, Brewer and colleagues, essentially they showed, we showed that this, there's this very um, robust difference. So groups that seem to um, <clears throat> identify ethnically more with that, uh, compared to um, um, less ethnic identification show increased responses within cortical midline structures. Um, by contrast, low ethnic identification is correlated with increased neural responses within the hippocampus. And it's certainly possible that um, when you're ethnically identified, you really engage more of these kinds of uh, social cognitive or um, perspective taking capacities. When you're less identified, you're more um, likely to engage a different uh, perceptual process, um, encoding knowledge. So. <clears throat> Um, you know, then we decided, well, you know, if ethnic identification, which is essentially a cultural value, uh, seems to modulate empathic processing or the capacity to really recognize and respond to the suffering of others, how is it that culture can influence empathic processes in a similar manner? So I'll just introduce you to one other, uh, one distinct cultural factor, specifically looking at hierarchy preference. So um, hierarchical relationships are typically found not only within um, dyads or within intergroup processes, but also uh, cross-nationally. So looking at how essentially cultures will vary in their preference for hierarchy. Um, and essentially, you know, within Caucasian Americans and Native Koreans, uh, and this is Bobby Chion's uh, National Science Foundation uh, research he conducted as a graduate student and is now starting a postdoc with uh, Ying Yi Hong at Nash, uh, NTU Singapore. And essentially what we see is that uh, within the ACC and uh, interior insula, there's this um, nice relation with uh, social dominance orientation. So increased hierarchy seems to lead to uh, less, uh, less affective processing, um, more egalitarianism, increased affective processing. Um, and then, you know, again, so these are people looking at uh, people within their own groups, uh, just essentially how much can you feel this uh, empathy or compassion. And we looked at many different cultural moderators of empathy, and I will just point to you that of all of these different types of moderators, it was really social dominance orientation that um, predicted the effects. So essentially, you can see here that um, Koreans uh, show this more increased in empathy um, towards Korea, uh, their, country, uh, their uh, group members. And then also Koreans uh, also show this increased preference for hierarchy. 
And um, this increased preference for hierarchy predicts this increased empathic bias towards or empathic preference towards group members. Um, <clears throat> and then we associated it specifically within a region, this lateral, uh, this temporal parietal junction, both um, left and right temporal parietal junction. So essentially, um, the neural activity within these regions was predictive of behavior. So showing this, or saying that you know you're empathizing with these with um, these people, and then also um, this social dominance orientation or hierarchy preference. So higher hierarchy preference predicting neural response within the left and right temporal parietal junction. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, this was interesting to us because it really shows the importance of really understanding the cultural values that are modulating um, these empathic processes and also, you know, um, potentially opening insight into why it is that we might seem that we have actually multiple modules for social cognition. So um, in this essence, and this is, um, this is uh, an amazing review by Heinen Singer, but it showing that you know, within egalitarian cultures, it might be really important to feel what other people are feeling. And within um, hierarchy-based cultures, it's important to really understand what people are thinking. And, um, and that is, in fact, possibly uh, why culture is, is important and, and also why we have multiple uh, brain regions that are uh, enabling us to have this uh, it's not only uh, socio sociality, but prosociality. Um, and so I'd like to just um, close by saying that uh, you know, we are looking at this model and we're testing this further. Um, we think it's very much related to closing the gap in population health disparities, as, al as well as uh, resolving intergroup conflict. And I'd like to uh, also um, point you to the International Cultural Neuroscience Consortium if you're interested in um, learning more about this research. They thank my wonderful collaborators, Lab at Northwestern, and you thank you very much. <laughs>